On this Saturday night, a twister turns deadly. Major tornado here. A powerful tornado touches down in southwestern Manitoba, killing two people and carving a path of destruction. Answering the call for help. Today's uh, announcement, though, is really about focusing on saving lives. The Canadian government announces plans to match donations for disaster relief in Beirut. As cries for an international investigation into the explosion grow louder. Plus, tackling your questions about COVID-19. I think it's appropriate to have a little bit of worry. We ask the experts to weigh in on students returning to school and choosing the right mask for children. Global National with Robin Gill. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Well, take a look at this. A terrifying tornado in southwestern Manitoba last night. The scale of the twister caught on camera by storm chasers. Police say those powerful winds lifted vehicles right off the road and tossed them like toys into a nearby field. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. At least two people were killed by that tornado. They were driving when the storm struck and were thrown right out of their vehicle. The twister touched down at around 8 p.m. in this rural community just south of the town of Verdon near Brandon. Our Joe Scarpelli is there and has the latest. It's been described as scary and devastating. Footage captured Friday night shows this twister touching down in western Manitoba, just outside Verdon, where Tammy Skelton lives. And I'm looking at this thing going... Go away, go away, get out of my yard. When it did leave her yard, she says she followed. And watching the destruction it was leaving behind, she dialed 911. The lady, all I can hear her saying is, please slow down, please slow down, I can't tell what you're saying. During that call, she says the twister flipped two vehicles in front of her. One man was trapped in an SUV. He was honking the horn, trying to alert help, trying to get someone to come and get him. They couldn't get to him because the hydro lines were down. The 54-year-old was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Two people were in the second vehicle. Police say they were thrown when the tornado hit. After a bit, they um, started CPR on the second person and... Yeah, it's very unfortunate. The 18-year-olds were pronounced dead at the scene just across the street from this farm property, one of the hardest hit areas. Dozens of volunteers now helping to clean up. It's quite bad, we got big trees down, we got bins down. Basically decimated, there's not much left. As pictures and videos of the tornado circulate online, the town's mayor is warning residents to stay back should another powerful storm emerge. A tornado, don't fool around with them. One minute it can be going that way, and the next minute it can take you right with it. Joel Scarpelli, Global News. Now, Environment Canada is still investigating and trying to determine exactly how strong that tornado was. The intensity is measured on what's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. Now, Canada has only ever recorded one tornado that reached EF5 status, the most powerful, and that was also in Manitoba. Back in 2007, that twister ripped through the town of Eli, packing winds of over 420 kilometers an hour. Incredibly, no one was killed or seriously injured. Canada's deadliest tornado was way back in 1912. What became known as the Regina Cyclone devastated that city, tearing through a residential area and its downtown, killing 28 people. Well, another twister in Edmonton in 1987 was both the second deadliest and the costliest ripping through the city and causing more than $300 million in damage. Well, turning to the situation in Lebanon now, thousands of frustrated protesters have taken to the streets of central Beirut. And they blame the country's leaders for Tuesday's deadly explosion and they're demanding justice. At least 158 people were killed in that blast, more than 6,000 injured, and dozens are still missing. International aid is now being rushed into Lebanon, including from Canada. But as Mike Drolet explains, Ottawa is not giving that money to the Lebanese government. Days after an explosion shook Beirut, protesters took to the streets to vent their anger. Police shot tear gas into large crowds trying to get to the parliament buildings. Undaunted, the protesters broke into the foreign ministry, where they symbolically burned a picture of Lebanese President Michel Aoun. This woman said they'll never forgive the government for their negligence. 
It was last Tuesday that a warehouse filled with ammonium nitrate blew up. Ayon has rejected calls for an international investigation, saying Lebanon would handle the matter itself. Canadian officials were careful with their words, but their actions spoke volumes. No money will be sent to the Lebanese government. Instead, aid will be funneled to organizations Canada trusts. And what we are focused on right now is responding to the emergency at hand. Lebanese Canadians have opted for a similar approach. A group of labor organizers are encouraging people to donate to specific charities like the Red Cross with proven track records. Essentially bypassing the state because you really don't want to give legitimacy to a lot of these state actors and politicians in Lebanon that have no legitimacy. And that perception is not only fueling the bitterness within Lebanon, it could impact how fast aid gets delivered to those who need it. And unfortunately, this is something that aid agencies uh, tend to deal with in, in many countries around the world. I think the existing relationships we have with communities and these local civil society groups will play a critical a critical um, role in this. With the government hanging on by a thread, it will have to. Mike Trillet, Global News, Toronto. Relentless rains are soaking South Korea with little relief in sight. Take a look at this dramatic moment when two rescuers pulled a woman from a partially submerged car. Now, fortunately, she was brought to safety, but at least 26 others have now died in heavy flooding and landslides caused by more than six weeks of intense monsoon rains, the worst that country has seen in at least seven years. And in India, a landslide that was also caused by heavy monsoon rain has killed at least 22 people. Rescue workers are now searching for dozens of others believed to be trapped under the soil and debris. The slide hit overnight while most people were sleeping, and even more rain is expected to hit the region. And also in India, investigators have now found the so-called black boxes from the plane that crashed yesterday, killing at least 18 people. The Air India Express jet skidded off the runway while trying to land in heavy rain. Both pilots were killed. Now the flight recorders may provide some answers as to what caused the crash. That flight was repatriating more than 180 Indians who were stranded abroad by the pandemic. Officials say it's a miracle that the death toll wasn't higher. This marks India's worst passenger aircraft accident since 2010. And an oil tanker stranded on a reef in the Indian Ocean has now sparked an environmental emergency. New satellite images show tons of oil leaking from a Japanese tanker which ran aground near the coast of Mauritius last month. The Prime Minister is urgently calling for international help, saying the small island nation lacks the skills or expertise to refloat stranded ships. Mauritius is a popular tourist destination known for its world-renowned coral reefs. To the pandemic now, as the U.S. nears 5 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, a quarter of all infections worldwide, President Trump is now issuing executive orders to introduce economic relief for Americans. That move comes after talks in Congress broke down this week, with Democrats demanding more than a short-term solution, while Republicans claim their demands amount to a blank check. As Jennifer Johnson explains, the Democrats could take the Trump administration to court. U.S. President Donald Trump says his executive orders will be the bailout millions of struggling Americans need to stay afloat during this pandemic. We've had it, and we're going to save American jobs and provide relief to the American workers. The president's orders will delay rental housing evictions, payroll taxes, and student loan payments until the end of the year, and reinstate additional unemployment benefits, which ran out July 31st for almost 30 million Americans. I'm taking action to provide an additional or an extra $400 per week in expanded benefits, $400, okay? So that's generous, but we want to take care of our people. Again, it wasn't their fault, it was China's fault. Less than 100 days until Election Day, the president blames Democrats for the impasse. Their $3 trillion plan included most of the benefits, but also more money for COVID-19 testing and reopening schools. Republicans didn't want to spend more than a trillion dollars. After nearly two weeks of talks, negotiations were called off late Friday. I've told them, come back when you, when you are ready to give us a higher number. Democrats have hinted they may sue the president, saying only Congress has the authority to allocate these funds. Money millions of unemployed say can't come soon enough. Right now, I have no kind of a lifestyle. I'm just, I'm here. 
That's how I feel. I just feel like I'm just here. And I'm lost. And I'm scared. Democrats still want to make a deal, saying the president's order is just a short-term fix for an economic crisis that will last well into 2021. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. A Canadian man has died while in the custody of U.S. immigration authorities. James Hill started feeling sick just days before he was scheduled to be deported. He died in hospital this week from COVID-19. And as Camille Karamali explains, his family is now demanding answers. His name was James Hill, but to Doug Hunt and his family, he was known simply as Uncle Jimmy. He was our favorite uncle as kids. And on Wednesday night, the 72-year-old died in a Virginia hospital from COVID-19, alone and scared, when he was supposed to be back home in Ontario, surrounded by loved ones. It was just so tragic that he was so close to coming back for his new life. The physician who studied at the University of Toronto and practiced in Louisiana had served a 13-year sentence for writing Oxycontin prescriptions without seeing patients. He was technically released in April, but was sent to the Farmville Detention Center in Virginia to wait out some bureaucratic hurdles caused by the coronavirus pandemic before being deported to Canada. It's run by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, known more commonly as ICE. <laughs> what he didn't know is what would happen there. The center was slammed with COVID-19 cases in June amid complaints of overcrowding and poor sanitation. In fact, some detainees have even filed a court application seeking immediate release, claiming they're an imminent risk of serious illness or death from COVID-19. There have been 290 coronavirus cases at the Virginia facility as of Wednesday. That's more than half of the entire population of the detention center, which currently consists of as many as 400 people. He was terrified of getting COVID. There was no physical distancing whatsoever. Hill was scheduled to leave July 9th, but the family says he was hospitalized with COVID-19 symptoms just a week before his deportation date. It was just so tragic that it was so close, you know. So his detention actually became unlawful just because COVID spread. He should not have been detained by the ICE. I said it is undertaking a comprehensive agency-wide review of the incident, but for Hunt's family, they're hoping Uncle Jimmy's story is a lesson to make sure changes are made at the Virginia facility. And he begged them to segregate him, and they didn't. And now he's dead. You know, I mean, that's, that's the sad part, that their negligence caused this. Camille Karamali, Global News. Coming up, our experts answer your COVID-19 questions. As schools scramble to reopen, how should parents prepare? Their answers next. Well, for months now, Global News has been taking your questions about COVID-19 and the pandemic straight to the experts. And unsurprisingly, a lot of questions lately have focused on schools. In just over four weeks, students across the country will head back to school, many for the first time since the pandemic closed classrooms back in March. But is it safe? Do parents have reason to worry? For the answers to those and other questions, we are joined now by Dr. Michael Gardam, Chief of Staff at Toronto's Humber River Hospital, and Dr. Craig Jenny from the University of Calgary. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, Dr. Gardam, let's start with you and let's start with schools. Uh, we know students heading back very soon. How worried should parents be about that, do you think? Well, I think it's appropriate to have a little bit of worry, but the fact remains we're not the first place doing this. There's been a, a number of countries that have brought kids back to school. And by and large, it seems so far to be working OK, although there have certainly been some small clusters associated uh, with opening schools. And Dr. Jenny, to you on that point, uh, particularly when we see images and headlines coming out of the United States where schools open and then within hours, in the case of one school in Georgia, a student tested positive and students were sent home to quarantine. So, you know, should we expect to see scenes like that playing out in Canadian classrooms? I think the situation here is quite different. So, for example, we have much lower virus burden in the community. Many fewer people are infected here. So the risk of introducing the virus is lower. Um, but as echoed uh, earlier, we need to still be vigilant. We still have to be paying attention to this. And the situation may change. If we look at the numbers as they exist right now in Canada, we can probably safely open schools with, with little concern. But those numbers change and, and we need to adjust as we move forward. And uh, Dr. Jenny, let's start with you on this next question about masks. 
Any advice to parents, though, on how to choose the right mask for your child? Yeah, so the masks have to be something that's comfortable. If the kids are playing with them, always adjusting them, taking them off and on, this is really what we want to avoid. So it has to be a mask that the kids are comfortable with. It's a mask that they want to wear. And there's no harm in starting them on the mask now to ensure that when they, they go to school in a couple of weeks, it's not a shock to their system. Yeah, and Dr. Gardam on that point as well, um, you know, this is one certainly we talk to parents and they kind of roll their eyes at the expectation that you will be able to get large numbers of children to wear masks for long periods of time. I mean, does that even seem realistic in your assessment? Well, you know what? I mean, honestly, we're going to find out. I mean, but, you know, I, I think to their point, you certainly can't rely completely on masks. You have to have a number of other strategies such as, you know, decreasing the uh, class size pushing the desks apart, et cetera. The masks are really only one component. And, you know, we'll find out very quickly how easy it's going to be for uh, students to be able to do this. Obviously, the older they get, presumably the easier it will be. All right, Dr. Michael Gardam, Dr. Craig, Jenny, don't go anywhere because we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to bring you some of our top questions from viewers about COVID-19 and the pandemic. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking with Dr. Michael Gardam, Chief of Staff at Humber River Hospital in Toronto, and Dr. Craig Jenny from the University of Calgary, taking your COVID-19 questions straight to the experts. And this question comes from Denise Redinger, who asks that if my child is in a classroom where another child tests positive for COVID-19 and is then told to self-isolate for 14 days, does that mean our whole house has to isolate for 14 days? And should I inform my employer? Dr. Jenny? So this is a, a tough question. It's important to remember that the self-isolation is different than the formal quarantine that we have, for example, travelers coming across an international border. So self-isolation, you are able to still go out for essential services if necessary. The goal here is to limit the spread. So if, if a child is suspected to come in contact with a classmate, we want them to stay home until we can determine whether they're positive or negative. But the parents in the house, for example, can still go to work. Um, but this is also where those recommendations of wearing a mask come in. If there's a risk that you too are infected and you wear a mask, you're going to greatly reduce that risk in the community until you know for sure whether your child has been exposed. The really difficult part is if kids have to stay home and parents have to work, often the childcare uh, duties then fall on other people such as grandparents who may be very much at risk if the child has brought a virus home. And our last viewer question uh, to you, Michael Gardam, comes from Stephen Ancliffe who asks, what percentage of the Canadian population would need to be vaccinated to open our borders to international travellers once again? Great question. We would all love to know the answer to that. We have to assume that we have a vaccine and the vaccine actually works well, but presided that that's true, uh, you know, looking at the relative percentage of the population to actually achieve that so-called herd immunity where the virus really can't spread very well, that's a wide number right now. People haven't really nailed that down. I've seen numbers anywhere from 20% of us protected up to 80% of us protected and everywhere in between. Part of the reason the U.S. border is closed right now is because the virus is really spreading largely unchecked in the U.S. And so they need to get their house in order before I think Canadians are going to feel comfortable opening the international border. Yeah, and I think, you know, if you ask Canadians what scares them most about the pandemic right now, it is what's happening south of the border and the headlines and images we see coming out of there every day now. Dr. Michael Gardam, Dr. Craig Jenny, gentlemen, thank you so much for helping us to answer some of those questions from viewers. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you have any questions about COVID-19, here's how to get in touch. Email your questions at globalnews.ca. We'll put them to the experts and bring you the answers right here on Global National. That is Global National for this Saturday. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight, your Canada is the big sheep wandering the hillside in Okanagan Falls in BC. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.